everyone this afternoon. Um, we are recording this program, so if you do not want to be on camera, you do not want your face show, please, you might want to turn off your camera, just FYI. Um, so welcome to our program with the Dallas Public Library. My name is Paige. We have our Ask the Expert with Air Fryers and Instapots with uh, Chef Sharif Osni from the Dallas um, Art Institute of Dallas, the Culinary Arts Program. And he's going to be making some very good stuff for us in the Instapot and showing us some tips and tricks and answering your questions as well. So um, if you have questions that were not submitted ahead of time, you can feel free to type them in the chat or you can um, raise your hand has to be unmuted and um, ask your question verbally so however you want to do it all right um, without further ado I guess we will turn it over to the chef and we will get started learning some new things about these great appliances that you all have uh, many questions about so let's go <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. And I have a number of individuals who have sent us questions, so I'm gonna be sharing it with you and I'll share a screen where you're gonna see the question, my answers, and I'll be taking you online to show you also some resources that answers those questions. Meanwhile, if any of you who are attending have a question, please, by all means, unmute yourself and just ask me and I will address your question live without having to wait at a later time. Let's get started, and I need to share my screen with you. All right, so we begin with here. The first question was brand related. I have friends who say that they got an air fryer and they didn't think it was that great. And then they bought a Ninja Foodie and are now in love with air frying. I would like to know your experience with different brands. So my answer right in here is that I tried Instapot and I have the Ninja foodie that I prefer over brands. However, it's important to be mindful that there are product defects. It happens in some brands and some models and there are also operators errors. But regardless of which to consider, product preference is subjective, just like food preference. So. I don't have one brand over the other, just like there are a variety of burger chains and to each their own, one prefer McDonald's versus Burger King or Whataburger. You will have to either go online as I'm gonna share with you in here. So this is a, uh, one of the websites, it's called the buyersguide.org. It's not a blog. I prefer to go to places that they do this for business and they provide their services for free. So, uh, let's see, moving from here. And there is that by uh, the, uh, it shows you in here the, the top 10 pressure cookers. The interesting, you go to another website, you may have this one on top. And however, regardless, you will see that the Instapot uh, ranks up among the top. The foodie is somehow always included in the top 10. Uh, and that's the one that I have and I've been using uh, simply because of size. Let me be clear about that. I'm a big guy and I like big things, that's all. But I'm not cooking, it, I'm just by myself. Uh, but for a few bucks more, going from small to large, this one, uh, the foodie, I got it from Super Walmart here in Dallas, at a regular price at 139 uh, And it is a, an air fryer and it is a... Uh, it's a cooker. It's, uh, it, it, it has nine different functions to include even making yogurt. It's a slow cooker as well. So it has nine different uh, things in one unit for 139 plus tax. I thought, why not? Uh, as opposed to this one here runs in about 50 or 60 and, uh, and I like it and I have it and I do use it when it's just me and I have no one else that I'm going to be cooking for or entertaining. So this gives you an idea that you can go to this website in here, and here's that buyersguide.org pressure cookers. So if you're watching me, you have two options. You can actually take a screenshot of this one or use your cell phone and take a picture of this one. So you can go to this website in here. And 
just educate yourself and pick and choose uh, what suits you. Uh, again, I wanted to be clear and for you to be mindful that all of these here are still subjective. It, it, people's biases are involved when they decide to judge uh, a certain product versus another. As I said, uh, I prefer over all of these the Ninja Foodie, and according to them, it's ranked number three. But to me, it brings me all the happiness and pressure cooking and a frying that I need, plus the slow cooking. So I'm very happy with this one. Moving on, there is another one in here is consumerreports.org, the multi cooker best. And here's that online. So, best multi cookers of 2021. And you will see that there is Bello Pro Series, which is not in the other one. Then you have the Breville, uh, there is the Cuisinart, the, uh, the Longhi the Instapot Max, and there are different brands, within the same brand, there are so many models that's tiresome to keep up with what it is. And the difference between one and the other, it might be one control or one button as opposed to press a dial, something very minimal that gets it to be one model versus the other, that sometimes, unless you really read very carefully, one may not be able to detect. Here's the Ninja Fuji. And again, there are different model under that. So I hope that I was able to give you a direct answer, but there is none. It's like asking me, what's your favorite car to buy to drive? And that is very subjective based on your driving habits. What's the purpose of you driving, where you're going, how often you're going to use it. All of these you have to take into consideration. This foodie in Ninja, I bought it for when I do big functions, up to eight people. So that's the only reason I got it when I entertain for my day to day every day for uh, air frying is this one. It just I don't want to burn too much uh, resources as an electricity to do something that a smaller thing that uses less mileage and gasoline to be able to do the same thing. Uh, if I'm going to do roast and pressure cooker, then definitely I'm relying on this. And this is big enough to be able to take a very large chicken, but not so much of a turkey. So, but a good large chicken can easily fit in here to be roasted as well. And we'll visit this more often. Second question regarding the Ninja products again, I'm very interested in the Ninja air fryer oven. This is the one that folds upright to save space. I would like to know how well that works for air frying as well its other functions. So. According, uh, just for the viewers who may not be familiar, what is this? Here we go. I'm going to go online. Open. It's a neat gadget. This, you can actually store it upright. So there you go. I mean, does it save a whole lot of space? Not, I mean, just think about this, putting it down versus upright. That's really all that you can do. It's not upright the other way, it's upright only that way. Uh, if it saves space, sure, go for it. Uh, so this is what the question is pertaining, that specific model. I would like to know how well that works for air frying as well as other function. It works very well. And that's similar to another question someone else asked that do I prefer the air frying in round shaped in these as opposed to the flat one? And I will go with the flat one if I had the space. Uh, but the flat one doesn't do all the function that the Foodie Ninja does or another Instapod does. So this is a great air fryer only. So it's, it's important to just, you know, that this is an air fryer. It doesn't do a whole lot of other things, maybe a few more, but it's in no shape a substitution for the Foodie Ninja or the Instapot that can do between six, nine, sometimes up to 12 different functions to include canning and preserving and pickling. This doesn't, but there are other models with a little bit more money that will do such. So I hope that answers that question in here that you see how it 
So the beauty about this, yes, you can do, you can make a pan pizza, you can do a lot of things. And because it's flat, it does roast more evenly and it does roast a little bit faster, a little bit. I mean, we have taken, technology have taken something like the recipe I'll share with you today that takes about eight hours. Today, I cooked the uh, Boeuf Bourguignon uh, on, under an hour, exactly 55 minutes. I did it 45 minutes. It wasn't just quite done yet. 10 more minutes and it is perfect. Falling off the bone with the vegetable, everything. Set it and forget it. That's pretty much what I did with the pressure cooker for today's recipe. But I cannot do pizza in this one. Maybe a small tortilla size pizza. That's about it. While this one can do more things than this round and oval shaped one can do. All right. I hope that satisfied that answer. Number three, I just tried the basket type air fryer at a friend's house. It is the Dash, which is this one here which is a lesser known. I first tried coating the basket with olive oil for chicken. It's still stuck. Tried using it for uh, tater tots and squash. Everything's still stuck and could not move the foods by shaking the basket at all. Then I tried with another kind of vegetable oil and it seemed to work with regard uh, to no sticking. And yes, I could shake the product. However, that was just some cut vegetables. I haven't tried it with chicken yet. I have. I guess the question is how important is the type of oil you use to coat the basket so you can e uh, effectively shake the food and it doesn't stick? Well, so here's the thing. The whole purpose of air fryer is air. So in all of their manuals, they tell you do not add oil it would be counterproductive. It uses only air through a fan that circulates at a very high velocity. And that almost like a sandstorm, if you will, or imagine if you were sitting outside and experiencing a dry wind, hot, dry wind, as I've, I'm a combat veteran uh, in the Gulf War. And that's something was very common in Iraq and, and that part of the world. Uh, so it says, do not add oil and do not use the pressure cooker or the air fryer for things like smoked sausage that contains a lot of fat. It will catch on fire. So it's not designed to have fat and oil is fat or butter is fat. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to, there are two uh, science. I don't like to say tricks and techniques. There is the science into if you have a frozen chicken or a frozen fish, or any frozen product, it is perfectly suited for air frying. So if you have something fresh, you want to do it in, it will be stale. By experience, I haven't been very successful to do anything fresh and put it in air fryer and get something good to include even potato. But instead of having to do potato from scratch, I'm going to go buy it from the grocery store frozen and put it frozen. And I have used the dash exclusively for chicken wings and for fries. But there is also a point that you don't want to overload the basket. So let me show you. This is great for one individual, maybe two, if they don't eat too much. Uh, it's not that big. It's about the size of the palm of my hand. That is it, right? So for me, a big guy, six foot two to 20 pounds, this is, this is a meal. I'm not gonna call it a snack, it's a meal. So if I'm gonna put fries in here, I am not gonna even load half of this with fries. It's just too much. It needs room for the hot air to circulate. So how much do you put? I mean, enough to cover the bottom so that way you can shake it. And the instruction in the book for uh, making French fries or any type of tater tots, uh, logs, uh, potato logs, it says that you need to, when you set it halfway, you need to pull it and shake it and put it back in. Uh, so um, the air fryer purpose, the whole idea behind the air fryer is to get rid of oil and fat. Why? Because when you combine fat with carbohydrate, that's when disease happens. So one or the other, I live a keto lifestyle, meaning I don't eat carbs, no potatoes, no rice, no pasta. I'm not missing them. I have many other things to substitute uh, that give me the, 
to fulfill the need of pasta and other things, but it's made of vegetable, like zucchini spirals or uh, slice my cabbage in a Chinese mandolin to be like spaghetti uh, and add it to sauce. And, and I eat it just like anyone would eat an angel hair or a spaghetti. Um, so this, I do it, as I said, if I'm entertaining just one or it's just me doing something, but I will do it from frozen, as the instruction said, I have tried otherwise, and it never did. I love the dash. It is my definitely a favorite of mine for the design, for the red color, uh, and it works, and I've never had any issues with it. There is with all of these and recipes in general. So as, an inst as a chef instructor, I try to explain which it takes a long time for people to understand, recipes are not etched in stones, meaning you don't follow them biblically. So even when it says teaspoon, that is not clear. If you wanna be very precise in a recipe to follow, as we do in an industry, you have to put it in gram or an ounces. Only then you are certain that no matter who does that recipe by following ounces or grams, they're going to yield the exact same results over and over and over. But if you call it a unit and a teaspoon, some people, their teaspoon is not big enough. Others is too heavy. So the flavors and the profile may end up being very different. Same thing with all these recipes in here. For you, the normal individual who's not being trained as a classical chef, you're going to have to go through a number of trial and errors. I personally go to many websites and blogs to see what people have to say about certain recipe. And that way I can uh, get a consensus of what's working, what's not working, apply science to it, and then go from there and do my own experiment. But I will not do my own experiment completely blind, trying to reinvent the wheel that's already been reinvented and many, many times by different bloggers and different users. So here's, uh, if somebody's interested to know more about the dash fly, uh, the dash fryer, there is this one here. And opening this one. Again, if you have question, please jump in, turn your microphone on and let's have a real conversation and a live one. So here's the dash brand and there you go. I like the red that it comes in different colors. Believe it or not, this one, mine, I got it from Marshalls. So you find a lot of things at good price at Marshalls, uh, dress, uh, Ross Dress for Less, uh, um, all of those type of department store, more, much cheaper in my opinion than if I have to go to Bed Bath & Beyond. And it comes in a larger size for four but I already have the foodie, so I really needed something just enough for a snack as opposed to a meal. I still can do chicken and I do chicken wings in this one, which is perfect. So I don't eat chicken wings that's already dredged in flour since I'm on keto, but I have used it. And again, I will always use frozen. It says even in the recipe, use frozen. Don't coat it with oil. The hot air will take care of what the oil should do. All right, so I'll keep this up in here and let's go to the next question. Uh, so how important is the type of oil? And here's a great website for all of you to understand and learn about oil. Correct, oils are not all the same. Uh, they have something called the smoking point and you have to be careful what you use. For instance, Somebody who doesn't know much about the cooking and are just venturing in it, they may think, oh, I love sesame, so I'm going to use sesame oil. No, no, no. That's like a teaspoon goes a very long way. It's not designed for cooking, but rather for flavoring. So this one has a chart for you about the smoke point chart, at what degree you use what type of oil. So it's very useful and it's attractive, and I thought I'd share it with you. So here's the website. There it is, aircookers.com, air fryer oil. Again, you can use the button on your computer to do a screenshot, or you can just use your phone and take a, a picture of this one. That's why I have it so enlarged, so you can see it easy. Shall I enlarge the page anymore? Yes, or keep it? 
I can maybe enlarge it one less. All right, there we go. This is as far as the whole screen will accommodate. Very good. Number four, this is also related to brands, I guess, but I am noticing in this one that I'm trying out mentioned above that the cooking is uneven as well, right? So what happens is some people think they're going to literally set it and forget it completely. You have to go and shake it uh, every now and then. The, the recipe usually says twice. I personally, as a chef, I will go and check two or three times, even sometimes four, just to get an even crispiness and an even cooking on all sides uh, that, that I have in the item. Being mindful, I am not overloading just because this is about three inch deep. I am not going to put three inch deep food. It's not designed that you're going to fill all of this with food, not even half of this with food. It's just too much. So the fact that there is three inch side, it's to allow for air, air circulation 360 degree. And below this one, at the bottom, there is a bottom that has holes. So it's like a rack that sits on it. So that way also the rack allows for air to circulate all the way through from bottom to top and side to side. So if you don't have a rack, whether you lost it or it's imperative, you're not supposed to cook food right on the bottom of the pan you have to cook with a rack. It's similar to thing if you're using an oven, you should have a roasting rack, not just a roaster or a roasting pan, but a roasting rack for the roasting pan. And that allows for 360 degree of the hot air in the oven, whether if it's convection or not, to be able to circulate and cook the food evenly. Otherwise, the bottom is gonna be soggy and wet and the top is gonna be crispy and overcooked. Awesome. So, so cooking in one part of the basket happens a lot faster than the other part, resulting in some things getting burnt before. My, my guess, and I'm assuming there are so many factors that go, but one factor that quickly jumps up is that when a person put the food in their basket, it may have had two or three pieces right on top of each other or very next to each other. Usually, even if you're using a regular oven, the technique, the proper technique in roasting anything in an oven is that you want to separate the items because when you cook food and it touches each other, you're steaming them while there is no water in the oven. But by touching them, just like you make biscuit, when we make southern biscuit, we put them touching each other. So the steam of one biscuit trans transfers the other and they rise. But there is also another method of making our southern biscuit where each one is separate and it will have more of a caramelized uh, and, and, and crisp exterior than the other one. So my, my recommendation is really start with maybe about six or eight pieces that, that you don't have to shake a whole lot and toss up and down and then see if that works. If that doesn't work with that minimal amount, then maybe there is something in the uh, device it's itself, which is common in the industry, even in oven, that you will have a hot spot and a cold spot. Because of this, even in oven direction and uh, menu and recipes, it's always recommended that you rotate your baking sheet or your baking pan, even cookies and cakes to have an even baking. Just, even ovens have hot spots and cold spots. All right, so is this eliminated if you get a better brand? Uh, yes, if depending, I mean, if, if you're getting a very lesser known brand and you can go online and you can see the feedback from the consumers that there is a major malfunction that seems to be consistent, then, then yes, to some degree, again, you get what you pay for. So if you go with something, you know, as cheap as 29 bucks, it's probably not going to do a good job. But if you go with something above $50, that's, that's a good basic, a good basic. And that's why I said a couple of bucks. You go from that $50, $60 basic into 139 monster. Why not? Uh, so that's just me. It's that way I, I'm good. Whether I want to cook for one or I want to cook for eight, I'm good to go. Whether I want to do chicken pieces or I want to do a whole 
rotisserie chicken in it, I can do that if I wanted to. All right, moving on to number, how do I find out how long to cook various food? Excellent question. And usually your manufacturer will, will have recipes in a booklet and also they have their website. So for here, there is this one that is fast cooking for pressure and open that and go here. And you have, this is just a beginning basic chart. If you visit the manufacturer, if it's a good well-known manufacturer, they must have a website uh, with the ability that many of the users, uh, they form a community and post their recipes and trials and errors. But you can see this is actually a very good one that goes into so much that's available to you to be able to figure out. Again, let me be clear, this is not biblical. Do not take the recipes biblically. There are many very variants that may end, which is one of them, how, how much do you load the food into your, uh, into your pressure cooker, uh, how frozen is frozen and how thawed out is thawed out. So there are factors, but figure out for yourself and then keep tweaking. I have to keep tweaking. As a chef, I never stop tweaking my recipe all the time. And if I learn to do it in here, that doesn't mean I transfer it there. I have to learn this one. So this is like a regular sedan. This is an 18 wheeler. So driving them is not going to be one and the same. All right. I have frozen cod and it's hard to find out how long to cook it. Well, no more. Here you are. This is a website that can give you a chart on how to cook uh, the frozen cods and with recipes about a variety of other ones. And here you are with beautiful pictures and the recipe and suggestion and other things for cod and all type of fish that would also be similar to cod. You can cook shrimp, you can do any type of seafood, including octopus, if you wanted to. And I did octopus in a pressure cooker about a year ago for a workshop. So it can be done. So I hope this helps you to find out there is, and here is the recipe for instant pot fish frozen cod. So that should take care of that question. And I hope that person is with us live today. If not, you're gonna be able to view this as a recording. Can you recommend simple recipe? After all, it's an Instapot. Well, that's the beauty of it. Actually today, the, the, the reason I chose uh, beef bourguignon of, or beef burgundy, cause it's a complicated dish. It's a dish technically that requires that you cook the beef separately and the potato separately and the carrot separately, celery separately, the mushroom are roasted separately. Uh, and then after the meat is cooked, you remove it and then you puree it or add a roux or a slurry to thicken it and then you combine. So it's, it's, it's a demanding uh, recipe. However, I did it today. And as I said, in the pressure cooker, and it took me 55 minutes, just put everything in. I don't like to use dump because we eat that food. I'm not dumping anything in it, but I'm definitely putting all the food, put all the seasoning. I put all the stock. I put uh, the potatoes, the onions, the carrot, the celery, the mushroom, and they came fantastic. And I'll show you the real product in a moment. All right, so that is my answer to that. So it's a trial and error. Anything that you can cook in any medium, you can do in a pressure cooker, especially something like the Ninja or Instapot or any of those brands that have multiple functions. They don't do just one thing. They're not just a pressure cooker. That's why they have a different name and a different look than the singular pressure cooker that we are used to uh, in days past. All right, so I have here a question. Quiero saber si sería bueno comprar una. I want to know if it's good to buy one. So the answer is subjective, depending on multiple things. Is it good to have one of these? Well, so one, you need to figure out what's the purpose. Are you just now you just want to jump on a fad? Do you think this is something cool to have? Number two, how often are you going to be using it? And number three, does your finances 
uh, support that you don't have to go, you know, break the bank to be able to get one. So overall, it will be used for compacting your cooking time from minutes, from hours to minutes. So that's that's a major plus. Like today, uh, my bourguignon recipe usually takes me eight to 12 hours. Uh, and that's quite a labor because I, I have to do everything separately. The consistency, it came uh, out and the smell, if there was a smell vision, it is out of this world. It's just phenomenal. So I am for everyday cooking. This is awesome. For odd cuisine that I would do in, in, a, in a high end restaurant. No, we're still going to follow uh, the, the same French classical of cooking every ingredient separately and combine them at the end. But for any other thing, it, it's just phenomenal. Uh, what else? Uh, if you're going to use it at least three times a week, if you're not going to use it at least three times a week, you know, if your finances are fine, go for it. And if you have the space in your room, in your kitchen, uh, go for it or in your garage. Uh, I store mine. I don't have room in my kitchen. I have so much commercial equipment in my kitchen. It just, it's just, uh, it's, it, I have no room. So I bought a special Rubbermaid box that I put this in it to preserve it. And then I put it in the garage. When I need it, I pull it out. And I use mine about two two times a week bare minimum bare minimum uh, there are there is always a good chance i'll use it five times a week that's on average so that's how useful this is for me this is on this is my weekend the dash is my weekend snacks single you know thing that i want to do i do it in here because it uses less electricity than i would with this big work uh, horse in here so the answer is subjective, but if you, again, if, if you have a real reason for it and you wanna cook healthier and you're gonna cook it frequently and it doesn't break the bank, then the answer is yes, it is worth it. Next question is when I want to go buy an instant pot at Nebraska Furniture Mart, the guy who was helping me said that they had been recalled and I should not purchase. So I bought a different brand. I have not used it once and I have had it about three years because I can't find any recipe or Facebook groups with this particular brand of appliance. So here's the good news. Uh, but you see, actually, this, this is a great segue from the last question I just answered. It's the frequency. So if you buy it just because it looks cool on commercial or infomercial or some of your friends have it, you know, it's up again. If it doesn't break the bank and you have room and space for it, by all means, do it. But since this person mentioned Instapot, so here's the Instapot web uh, website, and I'm gonna go in here, open another page, click that in, and voila, you'll have all the Instapot recipe that's available to everybody, whether you are an Instapot user or not. Here you are, to your heart's delight. You can pick appetizer, what type of food, what do you wanna do? Uh, and this is infused by also community. That means it's always ever growing as many people try different things and take pictures. They keep adding to the wealth of this website. The same thing with Food and Ninja. Uh, YouTube. I mean, I went and I checked, uh, you know, yeah, last night and there is no shortage uh, of these. You just have to now at least, you know, what to look for. So same thing with any other brands. You don't have to stick with just the Instapot because you have an Instapot. You can try different other brands, website and see what recipes you would like to try. Which air fryer do you recommend for purchase? Uh, I, you know, again, so it's subjective. It's like asking me which car would you buy? Uh, I drive a Kia Soul. I have Soul. I love it. Uh, I'm a six foot two. I have plenty of room. I don't need to buy more expensive car than that. It gets me 40 miles on the gallon. I'm happy. And it has great space in the back for all my culinary needs for functions and catering and banquets. So, uh, you know, again, to each, I have the Kia and I have the Monster. Uh, so, and there, I, so far, there is nothing bigger than this. This one, by the way, it's eight quart. They make it in six and a half. So like I said, eight quarts is the Monster. I would love eventually if they have a 12 quart because then I can have an entire turkey. Uh, right now, there is no way I can cook a turkey in this one here, but definitely a good large chicken will fit in just perfect. And I have cooked chicken a couple of days ago uh, and took it to, uh, to school just to show the student uh, the flavors and everything else. So 
All right. I am interested in purchasing an air fryer, but overwhelmed by the models and choices. I am a one person household, so don't know what size to get. So my answer to that individual is you are not alone when it comes. I, guys, I literally went like a scientist making a, an Excel chart and put the brands and the models and their pros and cons and prices before I bought this one. Uh, and I was about to buy it from another retail for 169 and I just pulled up my cell phone and then did a quick check. Where is the best price for that exact model? Guess what? Walmart had it. Wally World got my money, 139 instead of 169 And at that other one was supposedly on a discount, discounted price. Walmart had it, same exact, same, same model, no discount, regular price, 139 They got my money. Um, so I understand the overwhelming, and especially as you go from different websites, like I said, everyone is subjective on how they uh, judge which is better based on, you know, however they, what are the criteria? My criteria, I love the Ninja. I have the blender. It works great. Uh, I have it at home. It's not commercial. I don't use it for business, but for home, I, you know, it's just a great, great thing to have. So if you're certain that you will never cook for that individual, if you are certain that you're not a, never going to cook for more than just you, a dash would be good. There are pros and cons. You can only do chicken wings. You maybe can do one chicken breast. You can maybe do one thigh at a time. You can do two. It just, it doesn't have, it's not designed for that. It just doesn't. So if you're certain just that you are one and you, and you're not gonna be able to eat more than just one breast or one thigh at a time or cook it, not necessarily eat it, cook it at a the time, then something the size of a dash would be perfect for you. If for 30, 40 or 50 bucks more and you can get this one, if you can handle uh, that you have again, the room for it, it doesn't break the bank, then I would suggest with this one because you can do many things. This one is only an air fryer. This is, you can make canning, you can make yogurt. You, it's a slow cooker built into it. It is an air fryer. It's also a roaster. That's how you can roast a whole chicken. It's a roaster, not an air fryer only. So all these functions are all right in here and you'll pick and choose. And it's simply, it's so, it's a, it's a user friendly that you just press, there is nothing to it than that. Uh, you select the one of the nine methods that you want to do it and you press on it and you're done. So we'll talk about pros and cons in safety once I finish those questions and if anyone else have any questions. So the next to that, and you will never need to roast a chicken or a whole turkey. You can always buy them in parts or fabricate. So if you, know, you want to do for this individual, if you buy a whole chicken, you might want to fabricate it, break it down into the eight parts and only cook one part at a time. Be mindful, ladies and gentlemen. This is a household. That's why I said I do not use them for business. They are not designed for heavy commercial use for hours on end. They, they will burn. They will explode in, in some cases, as you've seen on YouTube. So for the pressure cooker, uh, I would say up to three to four hours max is it. You don't want to use a pressure cooker beyond four hours. You just really, you're working that horse to death and that horse will explode. You can go on YouTube and see some of the picture. People destroyed their kitchen, destroyed it. It exploded like a bomb and took everything. It took the stove, it took the vent hood, it took their microwave, it, it, it's like a bomb. So the fact that the person was able to survive this, it's by the grace of God. So there are some things Again, some people just keep taking this and the thing just keep cooking and cooking. You have to let it rest. It's a household. It's not designed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, you might need a couple of units if that's if you have a household of maybe eight people and you're really constantly gonna be using it, then you need more than one. Otherwise, it's just not gonna last. It's no different than cars. Again, if you have a regular sedan, it's not designed to be able to cross the East Coast to the West Coast on and on and on. It's not an 18 wheeler especially if it's going to pull even a trailer behind it. Sedans are not designed, they don't have the power engine to do so. This is no different. All right, so I hope I answered this individual question. 
which type is better, the air fryer with a basket style or the toaster oven style? I have read reviews of some air fryers that have the finish flake off with a few uses. What models do you recommend? So for better and faster, evenly fried and toasted food, the oven style is my preferred one. And that's the one that I showed you that it would look like you have a sheet pan that goes into it. You can make pizza. You don't have to shake it. You're good to go. Uh, I didn't buy one. I would like to, but I have no idea where the space is going to be. So even to overload my uh, my garage anymore with yet another rubber made and another uh, another equipment, I am at the point I don't really have room for this. When I brought this, I just was where am I going to store it in my garage? Uh, so this really just tipped me over. So I can't imagine I my if I do get one, I'm going to have to get rid of something and something about that same size. So it might be two things to get rid of in order to have one of those toaster type oven. Uh, so if you have the room, uh, I would go with the toaster oven, especially that you can make rotisserie chicken, the one that uh, uh, that you can put the, the chicken right in the middle and it becomes also a rotisserie. So there are some benefits to that. You can also, uh, that toaster, toaster oven, you can also have up to two or three racks that you can have cookies. So you can make a large batch of cookies. You can have chicken at the top, French fries in the middle, some bread at the bottom or some, whatever. The, and so you can actually roast and fry multiple things at the same time in the roaster type, as opposed to the basket type. This is also still is the basket type. It's just the basket. All right. Just be mindful. So about the exterior finish and coating, that was actually true up to maybe five, six years ago. Today, uh, if you go and look at all the reviews I've shared with you online, really you don't hear about it. The only time I can imagine this would start flaking if you put it very close to the stove or the to oven, any direct heat to include sunlight. So these are designed to be indoors, not outdoors. And if somehow, they might receive sunlight constantly day in, day out. Yes, it will, it will, the, the paint will peel. No different than cars. We see a lot of cars as we drive that their paint is just tarnished and, and it just, it doesn't look right. Um, so time just takes care of that. So make sure these, when you put them in the kitchen, you don't want them near to your, uh, I have electric oven and electric stove. These are nowhere near it. By the microwave, sure, no problem. But I am not going to put this on the electric stove. As some some people did, it creates a suction cup because it's a fan, and the bottom creates a suction cup. And there is one that the whole glass of their electric stove burst, and when it burst, it also burst their microwave that's right on top of it. I mean, horrible. Uh, so make sure you put this on a regular surface either a wood or something else, but not on a, uh, another cooking device. All right, let's see what else. I'm curious about these newer devices. Can I use my convection oven as an air fryer? The answer is yes and no. So according to Better Home and Gardens, they say, and this is a quote, most convection oven can air fry, but not air fryers can do what a convection oven can. So the main difference between an air fryer and a convection oven lies in the size. So one is the roaster versus the, the basket. That's the size. With a convection oven generally having more space for cooking larger amount of food at one time, as is the difference between cooking eight minute scones or 16 full size scones. So this, as I said, it can do a few. The roaster that I, one day I would like to have if I have room. Uh, then I can do more stuff all at the same time. But it's only me, even if I entertain people, I never entertain more than another four. Um, that is all. So I still don't have the need for that big, but it looks cool. So I don't have an issue with the, with the finances. I have an issue with the space. Where would I have? You can imagine as, as a degree chef and a chef instructor, I am a sucker for new gadgets and equipment constantly. If I like it, I buy it and I may not use it ever again. And I have a plethora of things in my kitchen and my uh, garage that would attest to that. 
All right, uh, so the fan in an air uh, fryer is located at the top of the appliance, as this is here. The fan is at the top. Same thing in here, but you can't see it because it is locked. It's just a one unit with the basket that comes out, uh, which cooks food a little faster than the back of the oven. So in, in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a regular convection oven, if you've ever seen one, you put it in and the fan is in here in the back upright. It, personally, I don't like cooking with convection oven. We have it at the school. I've had it in many restaurants I worked at and I always deactivate it. I prefer to have complete control. The difference between convection and non-convection, it is few minutes. I, I am never at such a rush in putting anything in the oven that a few minutes I want to gamble with in order whether to lose the product or the quality of the product, because that air can go anywhere and it's not very, the top one in here, definitely far better, but they haven't built commercial uh, oven with the convection where the fan is on the top yet. Everything is still upright. All right, so which cooks food a little faster than the back of the oven fan, but the convection oven doesn't require any specialty equipment or accessories like an air fryer does. And here's that link for the Better Homes and Garden. Where am I? There we go. One more. All right, and here's the website. If you have a convection oven, you have to have an air fryer and they answer all of these and the question the answer i shared with you is right here the bottom line using convection oven as an air fryer it's taken from this part in here so you can always reference that for you to be able to read more and about other things and i'll leave that up for you so here it is better homes and gardens and that is the link if you want to do a screenshot or take a picture with your cell phone so another question, what is so special about an air fryer? I doubt if you can make fried chicken, crunchy batter, dipped crust with it, correct? Well, so to answer the first one, the special, what's special about the air fryer, it's that you are cooking healthier with air, not with oil. Um, so that's number one, that you are eliminating the fat and just letting the air do the work, minimizing, you're not zeroing the fat uh, in case of the fried chicken, for instance, or a chicken fried steak or a chicken fried chicken, uh, you're not eliminating completely the fat because you're going to have flour uh, built into it. So number two, then, for deep fried food, there is no shorter time. So if you want to fr air fry food or the same food, do it frying it in oil. It takes the same amount of time. French fries going into a hot uh, oil to to, to cook or put them in air fryer, they both will take about anywhere between eight to 19 minutes, depending on the amount and the thickness of the product. So if you're having a, uh, a julienne French fries versus a logs, the country logs, that's when it's gonna take always longer. So it doesn't save time. If, if the thing it's about it using as air fryer, it just eliminates the extra fat that you don't need to cook with. So number three, yes, you can make fresh and frozen dredged fried food in the air fryer. You can actually have fried chicken, but I would not suggest getting your fried chicken dredged in flour and eggs and uh, buttermilk and putting it right in here. It's going to drop through the basket and it's gonna stick at the bottom of the main frying basket. So what you wanna do is use science in that case. And as many recipes tells you, tells us is to freeze it. So dredge it in flour, do the coating with the, uh, with the, with the eggs and the buttermilk, if you will, and any breadcrumbs, even on top of that, if you wanna do a German style or European style fried food, but freeze it, then take it from frozen to here, then everything is going to stay in the basket as a whole, just like frozen French fries, and it will cook. Now, I will be honest, you're not gonna have the exact crispiness of the hot oil. 
it will be crispy, but it will be crispy where the skin of that flour and egg uh, mixture slightly is separating after a minute and a half of serving it to somebody. You will be able to peel that, uh, that dredged uh, topping. Uh, the, the flavor is still great. Um, I live a keto lifestyle, so I do mine without any flour and it works great, but I do freeze my steaks. I will tenderize the steak for the chicken fried steak. For instance, I will tenderize them. I will season them well, and I'll put them in the freezer from the freezer in here. I have tried it fresh. After tenderizing it, it didn't do well. It just didn't have the visual appeal. It lost that. And flavor-wise, I really prefer the frozen. So sometimes one has to just follow science uh, on this one here. And yet there is one website in here, one of many, but I've checked a few, and I think this one, they did a far better job than others to do the chicken fried chickens. If anybody's interested, it's always going to be trial and error. Just because they did it doesn't mean your product is going to be this. Mind you, this is a blog. Bloggers easily lie. This, for all I care, might be a well uh, hot oil fried steak and just giving it the name of. I mean, there is no way to tell until you make it. Uh, but even they were honest and they said in here, it's not going to be an amazing crisp. So you're going to get close enough, but no cigar, but you're going to get close enough. You're going to, you're not going to have the crispiness of the oil. The only time, again, when I do French fries frozen into this, I get all the crispiness I want minus any added fat. Uh, so that doesn't make it fat free. It just makes it lesser in fat. And they show you the steps in here, but they don't show you a video. And that's why I would go with the caveat, you know, be careful, buyers beware in this case, recipe goers beware, because there is no video to show you that they've done it in the pressure cooker. Uh, so for, for all I care, they could have easily did it in a hot skillet and here's the product and let's just move it as done in a pressure cooker. All right, so this answers that. Moving on. I notice that there are quite a few parchment paper circles for air fryers. How do I know whether to buy them solid or with holes? And how do I determine what size to buy? So the only purpose for the parchment paper is a gimmick for easier cleaning. That's what they say. That's it, which is not true. It's a fallacy into you put a parchment paper in here. So once you're done, you move it, toss it, you're done. I wish it was that simple. How about all the sides? But forget even just the common sense of all the sides and everything else. CDC, FDA, USDA, DSHS, which is the state uh, health department of Texas, the local health department rules using a parchment paper does not excuse not washing and sanitizing anything properly. So in, in any commercial and even household, just because I use parchment paper, it does not negate the fact I still must wash it and sanitize it so there is no cross-contamination of something that might be there and lurking for my next, uh, next time I cook with it. So again, there, it's a gimmick, that's all. From a culinary standpoint, it's just a gimmick to get you to buy a parchment paper. Uh, but you can make your own. So if you do, you just get a piece of parchment paper, you put this on, you trace it with a pencil, and with scissors, you cut it. That's the easiest way to do. There is in the, in the classical repertoire in cooking, uh, it's called cartouche, and there is a way of folding the paper and centering it in here. You end up with the same result, but that would be for another uh, webinar that I can show you how to make the French classical cartouche to have it as a lid or as a bottom to cook with. The easiest way, again, just put this, trace it, cut it, you are good to go. How about uh, I need to make holes, get a pen, get a knife and just poke it, not put it in here and poke it, just poke holes in it. That's, you put it here, same thing. Uh, I would still always wash wherever goes in here. Frozen doesn't mean it doesn't contain bacteria. Uh, we cannot kill any bacteria just as an FYI on uh, surf safe and food handling practices, you can't kill bacteria. We've all seen that from uh, Jurassic Park. 
you can only freeze it. And once it's thawed out, it's back to life again. Can it die in the oven? As a matter of fact, no, it doesn't die in the oven. Up to 165 degrees, you just put it at bay. You never kill it. You and I, we all have bacteria on our hand and our body, and it's necessary to combat other bad bacteria that's always invading us. But my bacteria is good for me, not for you and vice versa. So we need bacteria, but it's under minimal amount, otherwise we'll end up in ER. All right, well, that's it. These are all the questions that I have received. All right, well, thank you. That was some great information. We do have a few more questions that were submitted in the chat and a couple that came in before the program started. Um, someone wants to know how to clean a basket, I guess, of the air fryer. How, what's a good way to clean it? Awesome. Excellent question, because, yeah, we haven't had that question yet. So the best thing to do is you're going to remove all of the these are all dishwasher safe. You don't want to wipe them. You want to wash them with, with warm soap, not abrasive uh, scouring pad, non abrasive. So I actually buy mine from Walmart and also from uh, Big Lots. They sell non abrasive, and it says that on it non abrasive pads. And these are good to be able, if you want to do it by hand and not run it. I don't run my dishwasher, it's just me. So my dishwasher literally is just a rack holder for my dishes, but I do everything by hand. For the fan and everything else, since there is no splatching, you're not gonna have much problem here. So a damp cloth, no soap, just a damp kitchen towel with some warm water, squeeze all the water out of it, because this is all electric stuff in here, and just wipe it. Don't try to go in and do anything just on the surface wipe it it'll be fine if it ever gets so bad and so dirty i would suggest unless you are a mechanically inclined individual there are uh, screws that you can remove the whole thing and then wash it or take it to the company local service dealer to be able to clean it for you or ask somebody who knows what they are doing be careful it looks innocent, it is not innocent. Uh, if, if a drop of water in the wrong place and may not evaporate, it's just lurking until you hook it up to electricity and God knows what happens. So be, be very, very careful uh, putting anything towards electrical. This part in here is all electrical. Yes, it's a lid, but it's an electrical lid, contains all the wiring in this. In here, there is just a few wiring to keep it warm, 360 degree. This is where the fan is doing all the work. All right, so that's a great question. What's the next? Okay, um, the next question. Uh, if you cook shellfish or fish in an Instapot, does it get rubbery or dried out? So if you, if you undercook it rubbery, if you overcook it, it will dry out. Because of this, I always tell the students, it's better to undercook because you can always continue cooking it until you figure out for you the right setting and how long. And then you write it on a piece of paper and you start creating your own recipe, if you will. Uh, but yes, I have done fish. I have done shrimp. I have done actually shrimp about a couple of weeks ago after I thawed it out, I didn't, it, I didn't like it. I preferred the frozen where it, so what happened is when I, when I thawed out the shrimp and I did it actually in both, the first one was in this one. And I thought, well, maybe because it's small, I may have done something wrong. I went and I bought another pound and tried it in this one. Uh, it didn't crisp as good as I would like it. When I froze the shrimp, so initially I bought the French fro the, the shrimp frozen. When I put it in my freezer and coming from the grocery store and put it in another hour, did it from exactly straight from frozen, it was out of this world. The, the, the shrimp has that complete shrimp flavor. It didn't lose anything. The texture was just phenomenal. It was crispy on the outside as if it was fried, but in the middle, you, I could taste the, the, the juiciness of the meat of the, sh uh, of the shrimp. So 
again, my suggestion, as many of the cookbooks tell you, frozen. Uh, there are a few things you can do. Uh, you can do not frozen, but it just doesn't have the same unless you're using a slow cooker. That's a different story. I am I'm, everything I'm answering in here as a pressure cooker. So, or an air fryer, pressure cooker and fryer. I'm not dealing with slow cooker and other things, which are great and they do a great job. But you know, since we are talking about things we need to cook in under an hour that otherwise may take four to eight hours, that's the goal of this class. All right, the next question. All right, um, the next question. Um, if I marinate chicken for 12 hours, uh, can I then freeze it before I air fry it? That is the perfect method. I, I agree. With you. And so the marination is going to infuse all that spice and flavor that you want to add to it uh, and then freeze it, and it will be phenomenal. I just did that a few days ago, and my house, and actually, I didn't even do the whole chicken. I wanted to practice my knife skills in fabricating a chicken. So I did it in eight parts, uh, supreme breast and the oyster of attached to the thigh. And, and I did all the seasoning, rubbed it really wet, put it in a plastic uh, bag in the, the freezer. And the smell in the house was like chicken potpourri. It was just awesome. So, And it stayed for quite some time. Great. Um, we have a question about what kind of thermometer do you recommend? So instant thermometer, let me show you mine. Uh, I would prefer that you would get a digital one that is an instant read as opposed to as to opposed to the regular one that you might have to calibrate. So this one here this is the cheap everyday thermometer that you'll find just about everywhere. The problem with this one, you will have to calibrate it every so uh, every so much uh, in cold ice to make sure it returns to zero. The one that I always use every day, it's this one here, and that's a digital thermometer. There we go. And this one has the Celsius and the Fahrenheit, and I just press on it, stick it. It takes literally a split second to get me the right degree. This one, you have to be patient and wait on the dial to just keep moving until you get there. And in commercial, even in, in other places, I don't want to poke this and just keep it in uh, exposed to regular room temperature air when it's especially in hot environment. This is great, and uh, this is Taylor brand. And it's NSF approved, meaning commercial approved. And I believe it cost me about 17, 18 bucks. So it doesn't break any bank. And I've had this over six years. That I haven't even changed the battery yet that came with it. And I use it constantly, heavily, every day in kitchen and in, in classes uh, that I teach and also at home. Great question. All right, um, a follow-up question on the freezing the chicken. Um, they want to know how long you should freeze the chicken once it's marinated before you fry it. It, it depends. My freezer, I keep it packed. I have a lot in my freezer, so things tend to freeze very quickly. I did time my chicken when I freeze it and other things, and it runs between four to six hours. It's frozen. Now, when I depleted my stock in the freezer uh, last summer, and I only had a few items, I noticed it took 12 to almost overnight for anything to freeze. So a trick I've learned that every uh, in my freezer, I always have two 10 pounds ice bags just there. If nothing else, they maintain the temperature and help uh, magnify uh, the freezer to freeze other product fast. And they tell you actually that in the freezer and in the refrigerator. The more you add stuff in it, the longer it stays and it cools faster. So for you, it's going to be trial and errors until you figure out four, six, eight, overnight, or 24 hours. Hopefully not 24 hours unless you got nothing in your freezer. It'll take that long. 
Good question. All right. Um, and we have a few questions about um, sharing some recipes. Like, do you have recipes for chicken or um, some easy recipes for the Instapot or the air fryer? I do. Uh, where, so, uh, where to get recipes? <laughs> so, as a chef at this point in my career, I actually make my own recipes, but I am familiar and I still remember. Uh, the complete French foundation. So that's that's where I started, uh, and that was in 2008 when I got my degree in culinary. Uh, as you progress, kind of culinary is an art. The degree it's called culinary art. It's an associate of applied science or a bachelor of science in culinary art. So I don't do recipes anymore as much as I do ratios. And with that, you don't have to remember recipes. So ratios and learning ingredients, you can actually create recipes all the time without having to refer to a book. When you think about it, there is about 30 type of herbs. That's it, worldwide. There is about 30, you're done. Between oregano and thyme and sage and black pepper, there is just 30 spices. And, and then just a handful of fresh herbs, right? That's it, you're done. So if you know the ratio and what works with what and what doesn't work with what, it's easy to create things and experiment. And that's part of the fun cooking. That's what got me into culinary. It's the ability to artistically express through cooking and baking. So for instance, if you're going to use cumin, it works great with coriander. And if you use cumin and coriander, the two of them works great with any citrus, lemon or lime or kaffir lime. So you learn quick, if I use one, I might want to use the other two. Your usual suspect in chicken uh, spices are the thyme, the sage, uh, rosemary. Uh, these are usually the three or four that stand out. Above and beyond those, the usual suspect, you can add onion powder, garlic powder. I personally prefer to add in my chicken oregano, which is unusual. You don't see oregano as part of the chicken spices that you buy, otherwise known in the market as poultry seasoning. But the oregano sets my flavor very different than any other chef in any other restaurant. And to wait a minute, there is something sweet that you add sugar. And people just don't realize that oregano has some sweetness. And if you do it sensibly, it does add je ne sais quoi into your spices. Spices for the chef are like the musical notation for the musician. There, is, there are only so many keys but look at where we are today and we're still making still new music. That's the same thing with, with herbs and spices. Recipe wise, you might wanna consider if you wanna do something on the classical style, Bon Appetit magazine online, uh, any of those renowned culinary magazines online will give you a, uh, a better and well-tested for baked product, King Arthur flour, they have a great, a website with the professional community providing feedback on the recipes that King Flower, that King Arthur Flower comes up even with. So they have many professional people. They could be household professional, they could be commercial professional, and they put their feedback. I tried the recipe and here are some things that worked and here are some things it didn't work. Of course, you have the usual suspect of the food network and its army of, uh, uh, of entertainers. Uh, they are great chefs, but mind, be mindful that there are only so many recipes and only it's, it's like riffing on the song. That's what the Food Network has reached at this point. And so it is what it is. I mean, I'm a degree chef and I've learned the entire French classical foundation of cookery in two years. That's it. That's all that there is. There is no more. On The Bachelor, there is no more cooking in culinary. It's all about management, catering and banquet and special events and functions and uh, money and finances. It's not about cooking. So all the cooking that one can learn as a French classical Escoffier foundation, it's in two years. You're done. And that's learning everything around the world. When I say French classical, I don't mean from Paris only. No, I'm talking every state in America, every... Uh, every country in the world, eight in, in the seven continents, every world in the seven continents. So I may not have too many recipes, but you end up learning when do you use this and when do you use that? So if you, if you like also many of your poultry uh, company that uh, raise poultry, they have on their website recipes. 
that usually it's an heirloom recipe. And I'll tell you that this is by grandma, such and such. And that's where the family itself, as they, as they use their own chicken, these are the recipe that they cook for themselves. Good question. I hope that answered. Oh, I think it might now have some good information. Um, someone is wanting to know uh, if they can use the Instapot recipes in an old-fashioned pressure cooker, if it's similar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what I did today was, in the, was a pressure cooker. So in 55 minutes, I was able, and with everything in, I was able to do the beef bourguignon or the burgundy beef that otherwise... Uh, prior to this, this is actually was my first time to do it in the pressure cooker. And, and I did that because when Paige, you know, asked me if I want to do it, I said, challenge me. I didn't want to do something comfort. I want to challenge myself in every opportunity. But I've always done it, uh, the beef in the slow cooker and everything else roasted it separately. So that's what we do in commercial kitchen. If you go to an hotel or a resort around DFW, Austin, whatever the place may be, that is the classical way to prepare it. And then you bring them together just like an orchestra. So each ingredient is a musician and you bring them together uh, to play one keynote, which is the beef burgundy. I put everything in here and it was awesome. The only thing I did not put is the burgundy. And that's just my own personal style. Instead of cooking and reducing burgundy or any wine for that matter, I'm not, I'm not a wine drinker. I have no tolerance to, to alcohol. I go to sleep like a baby. But if I'm going to use wine to make it even easy on the pocket, at the end, just add a teaspoon or a tablespoon or even a quarter cup. Why do you want to evaporate it? So in the French classical, Escoffier was cooking for kings and queens and billionaires, and he didn't care uh, what money is. Because of this, he would use heavily a lot of wine and keep reducing it. But you can achieve the same thing, but very end, instead of having to do one cup of wine, reduce it to half a cup, just add a teaspoon or a tablespoon, and people will, who love wine into their cooking, they, will, they can taste that. So I hope that answered the question. Next. Sorry. Um, one more question. Um, they said when you were mentioning the pressure cooker, did you mean the old style pressure cooker or are you referring to the Instapot? No, no. So uh, there it is. No, the Instapot is a pressure cooker. This lid, this is your pressure cooker lid with the pressure cooker valve. No, I mean, this is literally, as I said, it's nine different things. You just change the lid and you put, and this is your insta, your pressure cooker. It'll go up, it'll whistle. It is a pressure cooker. And this one comes, and most of them, they come with two lids. Some of them, Instapunt, they come with one lid that's multi-usage. This one, they have one because of the fan and one without the fan for the pressure cooker. So I mean an actual old-fashioned pressure cooker, which is this, this one here. It just so happened to be in that one device. I still have my old pressure cooker, way old. We're talking old like in the 70s. I still have it in my kitchen. I haven't used it, especially since I've had this one. Let's see, another question. Um, in a conventional pan style only pressure cooker, I have two options to release pressure, quick release and slow release for the steam. How do you do this in an Instapot? The same, the same thing. So there is a dial. Let me see if I can come closer to the camera. So right in here there is a dial that tells you whether you're going to do slow let's see there you go so there is a dial and the dial has an arm and this arm in the ninja type will tell you and you'll choose which which one do you want to do one in here or the one in there the the difference between them is it's about a quarter of a turn that's all but it will be a regular 
or a slow. While this may not be very clear on the camera because I can't see how I'm perceived on the camera, but when you, if you go to the grocery store, to whatever place you go to and you look at their pressure cooker or the Ninja Foodie, you will see uh, they have it all in black and that's why it might be very hard for somebody to see it on the camera. Uh, but actually I like it in black. It just looks, it looks great. Um, and it has in here vent and it has seal and you just set it up. It's a quarter turn. I wish they have made it a little bit more like a half a turn to be more clear, even for the use for the user. But it's just a quarter turn. That's it. And then on the inside, there is the pressure cooker on the inside. So there it is. This is on the inside, and this is the one on the outside. For me today, I did it with just a fast release. I really had no reason to do a slow release. Uh, some recipe for slow release, it might be if you have something might contain uh, condensed milk or something of that nature that you have to be careful when you open it, it might suck it, create a, a sucking action. And that's why you want the slow release from bursting in the face. But I had no milk product uh, or dairy product in, in the recipe today. So I didn't need a, a slow release. All right. Well, you have some very great information. We appreciate you uh, sharing that with us. Um, we're almost out of time, but we do have a few requests for you to share the recipe. Um, so if you don't mind um, emailing that to me at the end, or you can Certainly. put it in the chat or something. A lot of people are wanting to have your recipe for that. Certainly. And if anybody... If anybody want to write it, I can give it to you right now. Also, are we do we have like a minute or are we out of time page? Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, but we yeah, so that's we're, plenty of time. I mean, so that's plenty of time. <laughs> so let me give you some ideas on what you need to buy first. If you're going to make any type of beef stew, what type of cut you want? So let me bring that out. So if you're going to make like a roast, here's the type of meat that I have that I got. I got two pieces of these. You want a little bit of marble. Just be careful not to get one with a lot of marble. Uh, I don't like to use the word fat is flavor because if it is, we all going to be eating fat. There is no restaurant sells fat, but a little fat adds flavor. And there is a difference. So I never consider flat is flavor, but a little fat adds flavor. And because of this, you need a little bit of that fat and a good marble. A good a marble is that amount of specks of fat that you will find in those steaks. Uh, this is a good size steak. This is three pounder. And that's usually, in my opinion, for a roast, it's a good one. Anything smaller than that you're going to have to adjust your cooking time for the recipe because it's going to go much faster. But for a three pounder, that's what I did in here today. And it took 55 minutes. And this one, I cut it into two inch chunks. Uh, to that, I added, so here's my, the recipe, three pound of this. And I use six cups of liquid. So that means for each one pound, two cups of liquid. That liquid is a combination of beef broth, chicken broth, vegetable broth, and or water. And I prefer to use the water uh, than a lot of beef, for instance, because this is very beefy. This will provide you with a lot of beef. So I, what I did today is I used one cup of beef, two cups of, uh, uh, of chicken broth, and uh, two cups of water, of which I added two tablespoon of tomato paste uh, to that and whisked it all together. I also added a little bit of Worcestershire sauce just to give it a something called umami. And that's the highest sense of, uh, of our ability to, to taste something that is desirable. 
And then I added uh, about a tablespoon in all of this recipe, a tablespoon of low sodium soy sauce, yet another umami. And that's a Japanese word for the highest level of our flavor profile next to sweet and sour and all of these. Umami is the highest level. It just makes it rich. Mushroom is umami. Uh, Parmesan is umami. So because of uh, MSG is umami. Because of that, some people can and some people can tolerate umami. Either they think it stinks or it just gives them heartburns or makes them burp. And, and to others, it does not affect me in anything. But I use it moderately, sensitively, not a whole lot of uh, load of it. Next to that, I add something called the mirepoix. It's a French word that basically made a combination of onion, carrots, and celery. And the amount per pound on an average, the standard is four ounces of onion, two ounces of carrots, and two ounces of celery per one pound of beef or chicken. If you love onions, you can add more. If you don't like celery, you can omit it. If you don't like carrots, you can omit it. If you love carrots, add more. If you like celery, add more. So the recipe is not etched in stone. You can modify it and make it your own. For potatoes, I got something called finger link potatoes. And these are small potatoes. And then I used baby carrots. And that is this two right here the beef bourguignon. So I have whole cooked in the pressure cooker. Uh, and just to show you how tender it is. It's just very tender. Then I have whole mushrooms. These are potatoes. They all cooked at the same time. And every one of them is fork tender. And then here's the beef, and you can see the two inch end up eventually shrinking to about one inch. And for the sauce to thicken it, I didn't use a roux or flour. I just got the, uh, the sauce that was in the pressure cook it as I strained it. And I pureed it with some of the mushroom, the celery, uh, the carrots to thicken the soup naturally. And this you would serve it as is with French baguette or any type of French uh, or any type of bread and or mashed potatoes and or uh, rice or uh, noodles, egg noodles. So that's how simple it is. 55 minutes. All of this was here. So this is the quantity. That's all that was in here. And it took that much minus the basket. I did not use the basket. I just used this one here for it. So this is a good amount of, uh, this is for four. By the time you add rice, mashed potato or something else, this is a good amount for four. I'll be careful. There we go. That looks good. Yeah, it's <laughs> delicious. If there is a smell vision, it's just incredible. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chef. We, um, we really enjoyed all of the information you shared with us and um, we hope we will be able to maybe get you on for a future. Someone suggested maybe doing something on spices or something like that. So we will definitely keep you in mind. And we thank you again. This was very informative. Thank you all for the opportunity. And thank you for joining us live. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all for joining us. Um, please check out our library catalog for more upcoming programs and we hope to see you all in the future for um, in person stuff when we open back up. We are looking forward to that. So thank you again, Chef. Have a great day.